who helps prepare these multi-million dollar cargoes. This is a fairing for the H-2A rocket. The main purpose of the fairing is to reduce the wind resistance on the rocket going out of the atmosphere into space. The satellite is housed inside the structure. We do change the design of the fairing depending on its mission, its size, its payload, how many satellites we want to put inside at the same time, and so on. The successful launch of the ALOS and the MTSAT-2 satellites depends on the new H-2A. Every component must work flawlessly. By reducing the number of parts by 20%, engineers hope they've eliminated the risk of failure. Imagine if one in every 10 commercial airline flights ended in failure. That's more or less what's happened with rockets over the last 50 years. Liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission and it has cleared the tower. Rocket malfunctions are extraordinarily expensive and sometimes catastrophic, claiming human lives both in the air and on the ground. But rockets have become so essential to launching satellites, the challenge to engineer more powerful and reliable launch vehicles is increasingly important. After years of engineering and design modification, the H-2A emerges to face its first challenge. This is the moment of truth. Will every part do its job? Tanegashima Space Center launch conductor Takeshi Fujita knows that a successful launch is a minor miracle that defies the odds. Rockets are a crystallization of modern technology, so what it is is a very complex system. For instance, with the H-2A, the whole thing takes up somewhere around 200,000 parts. If any one of them goes wrong, the rocket is not going to work, so it's quite a difficult task. From the H-2A's maiden flight in August 2001, to its fifth in March 2003, this complex system performs almost flawlessly. We have the lift off of the H-2A launch vehicle number one. Japan is back on the international aerospace stage, and the H-2A rocket looks to be their savior. But in rocketry, events can turn from good to bad very quickly. That's exactly what happened 11 minutes after H-2A number 6 lifted off from the launch pad on November 29, 2003. At an altitude of 422 kilometers, it became clear the rocket was not performing according to the flight plan. Mission controllers were left with no choice but to order the launch vehicle to self-destruct. Within hours of this costly launch failure, engineers announced that one of the H-2A's main solid boosters had failed to separate from the rocket's first stage. I was shocked, but I'm not the kind of person who just keeps feeling down. If anything, we just made a fresh resolve to achieve our mission. For JAXA, it's back to the drawing board. Over the next 14 months, they make more than 80 changes to the H-2A's design. A successful launch since then suggests they may have fixed the problem, but flights 8 and 9 will be the most critical test yet. Launching two rockets consecutively within two weeks has never been done before in Japan. And if successful, we will improve the reliability of our rockets and the possibility of developing business in the future. Now we are feeling the responsibility and are nervous about the launch. The success of the H-2A ultimately depends on the design and engineering of the rocket's unique Japanese engines and its two-stage structure. According to engineer Totsuo Nomikawa, Japan chose a two-stage rocket for a fundamental reason. 
We decided on a two-stage rocket as it seemed to be able to use the engines to the optimum. We fill up the vehicle's tanks with a huge amount of fuel. If it was a one-stage rocket, even when there's not much fuel, the mass of the tank is still there. If we can throw away the unnecessary structure after burning all the fuel, the rocket can fly with much lighter weight. What makes the H-2A different from almost all the other launchers is that both the first and second stages are powered by liquid oxygen and hydrogen. This immensely volatile fuel powers two rocket engines designed and built in Japan. The H-2A's first stage engine is known as the LE-7A. It's gained a reputation as one of the world's most reliable liquid-fueled rocket engines. The LE-7A generates 1,100 kilonewtons of thrust in a vacuum. That's roughly equivalent to the power produced by 450 Formula One racing cars. Powerful as it is, the LE-7A will need some help. Because of its heavy payload, the H-2A's first stage will have four strap-on solid boosters, as well as two main solid boosters. Combining liquid and solid fuel engines in the first stage is extremely challenging. Nevertheless, the Japanese have successfully mastered this, this technology, which means that you, you are looking at two rocket stages of great power, which, when added to by the solid fuel engines at the side, mean that the H-2A packs a very powerful punch when going into orbit. But before they're strapped on to the H-2A rockets for flights 8 and 9, all the engines must first pass a rigorous check at Tanegashima Space Center's test facilities. This is the Solid Rocket Booster, or SRBA test firing facility. We set an SRB on this stand, light it, and see how it fires. We test its propelling power, response, mobility of the nozzles, and so forth. This is for quality assurance. The basic design of the H-2A's solid boosters is licensed from the United States, but Japanese know-how has been used to modify and improve this design. Today's SRBA consists of imported technology and our own development. We have ideas for our own rocket and have been working on various developments, and that's how SRBA came about. While Japan has adapted and modified the solid booster technology from overseas, their second stage liquid-fueled engine, the LE-5B, was designed and built in Japan and has exceptional capabilities. Well, the point is that there are only two two-stage engine rockets in the world. One is the RL-10 in America, and the other one is the LE-5B in Japan which can be ignited and reignited. Being able to turn the second stage engine off and on again has several advantages. The rocket can coast for several minutes until it reaches the correct position above the Earth's surface before firing up its engines to inject the satellite into its precise orbit. This gives the launchers far more control.